Okay, welcome everyone. I'm very pleased to uh, this evening be able to welcome Anapuma Kundu to GISA for a lecture. We're very pleased that you are also here um, on a very short trip from very far away. Um, so to just give a brief few introductory notes, um, Anapuma was born in Pune, India. She graduated from Sir J.J. College of Architecture, University of Mumbai in 1989 and received her PhD degree from the TU Berlin in 2008. In 2013, she received an honorable mention in the ArcVision International Prize for Women in Architecture for her, I'll quote this, declaration when, dedication when approaching the problem of affordability of construction and sustainability in all aspects. Her latest installation, Building Knowledge and Inventory of Strategies, was uh, recently exhibited at the 15th Architecture Biennale. I think actually it's just closing now, right? Next week. Next week. So you still have one more week to go. <laughs> um, Anapuma Kundu's internationally recognized and award-winning architecture practice actually started in 1990, uh, 26 years ago, and it demonstrates a strong focus on material research and experimentation towards an architecture that has a low environmental impact and is appropriate in the socio-economic context. She has built extensively in India and has had the experience of working, researching, and teaching in a variety of cultural contexts across the world. TU Berlin, the AA School of Architecture in London, Parsons New School of Design in New York, the University of Queensland, Brisbane, IUAV in Venice, ETSAB in Barcelona, and currently, I believe you're a professor at UCJC in Madrid, where you are the chair of Affordable Habitat. Um, you're also the Strock visiting critic at Cornell University. That's, That's old. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, it's been um, just a quote, something that you said that I thought was uh, interesting is that on your own career, that it's been about building knowledge um, in both its meanings, one being the focus on uh, knowledge about buildings and context appropriateness, and on the other where building is meant as a verb, and each architectural project is seen in the opportunity to advance those forms of knowledge amongst those of us who are involved, but also amongst those other experts from related fields, including craftsmen who produce buildings, as well as others who are affected by them directly or indirectly. I've heard you many times say that you have one foot in practice and another in academia, and that each area of your engagement has enriched the other. And so you have a research-oriented practice and a practice-oriented teaching approach. Lastly, I'd just like to say that you made a note also that you have um, become well known for these socioeconomic sustainable projects, but you've also been doing many projects that we might consider more kind of in the mainstream um, rather than sort of just uh, alternative practice. And I hope that we'll see many of those this evening. Thank you. Welcome, Anna Puma. Thank you, Lisa. Thank, thank all of you for inviting me here. It's a real pleasure to be here in New York and um, share my process with you, especially because I was uh, invited um, to share what I've put up in Venice. I want to say that actually that, was, that is better shared in an academic environment. There's too much there uh, in that installation, so I've... Um, you know, the, the, in the busy rush of things in the Venice Biennale, people are not going to be able to actually get all of it. But I, since it was the 25th year of my practice, I decided to put all of that together and organize all the work I've done so far. And so I took it as an academic project, this being the last week that uh, it's still ongoing, you know, the, the exhibition is still open to people. I'm very happy to actually explain it, and I've organized this presentation, um, uh, you know, uh, along the lines of the um, installation that I put up. What, um, in continuation with what Lisa explained about how I intend to uh, 
what I intend to express with the word building knowledge, both its meanings. Um, I would like to say that um, that there is uh, that we are at crossroads. Everybody's talking about environmental crisis, social segregation, and all of these things. And uh, the fact that nobody anywhere in the world, whether it's in New York, whether it's in Madrid, whether it's Bombay, people can't afford housing. Most of the whole salary almost goes into the rent of a place. And so we are going to have to really re reinvent everything, I think, because we are running out of resources. We are, the, way we are, the way we build doesn't work anymore. I mean, there, there's a lot to be unlearned. There's a lot to be, um, um, you know, proposed. So um, this was already the scenario 25 years, 26 years ago when I graduated. So right at that time, I had thought that I needed more time to develop knowledge as I go along. And uh, that's why I initially had this title. But right now, I'm at a place where I like to use architecture as an instrument to build knowledge in places and bring these diverse people together who've, who are not talking to each other between architects, um, you know, contractors, um, engineers, and so on. So, um, so yeah, with this uh, background, I would like to just set up the key concerns that inform my practice and my research by mentioning a couple of um, with each image, one of the global scenarios that l call for a different way of building. This slide re represents to me the bulk of India, an agricultural society, even though it's rapidly transforming. This is also how the planet is moving from rural to urban very rapidly. The, the people who are changing their condition, living conditions from rural areas to urban areas are not able to change their mindset as fast as their physical conditions um, change. So this is, I'm just listing the concerns and then I'll take you through the response, my architectural response to that. The other is this picture. This is exactly, this picture is really old, so today it would be much more crowded. This is Bombay, uh, this is uh, where this, this image is um, at least 10 years old, so I don't know how it looks like now. Um, One-sixth of the planet lives in India. Like, one-sixth of the population is located in India on a land that is only 2.4% of the, of the global, you know, um, sort of uh, land area. So the resources, although India is very richly endowed with resources, obviously the cake has to be cut much in much thinner slices. So I think even if other people call something sustainable, it's not automatically sustainable for India because we have many more mouths to feed. This is one of the concerns. Then there's also this globalization trend that's calling for global standards of buildings. This is what's happening in Gurgaon, in the outskirts of Delhi. Uh, you see that you see that the kind of um, things that are being promised, you know, as a symbol of 21st century. But you see the ground; it's got pigs and cows, and you can realize immediately that it's a village in which there's, you know, they've they have, there, there's this kind of a, an aspiration that's being also promoted because there are a lot of international manufacturers and uh, companies that have got global offices and they, in order to station people there, they have to give them the same standard of centrally air-conditioned buildings and so on. The ground reality is different. We don't even have enough power to run all those new malls and things that they've created. There's not enough water to supply. A lot of deve developed, new development is uh, not uh, ready for occupation because the municipality is not able to deliver the basic infrastructure. So this is a very good example because you th see three skylines here. You see the naturally slow growing, um, not slow, I shouldn't say slow, the organically growing um, you know, development in that along that main road that goes on the you know, highway outskirts of Delhi. So you see that, let me just see the, sorry, the, how does one, I forgot. Never mind. 
Oh, yeah, there. You see, there's this skyline. And then there are all these kind of glitzy towers and high-rise buildings that are proposed through a new joint private-public partnership. And in order to build all that, you see the front skyline, these slums. You know, these are the people who've migrated from villages to be able to serve as unskilled labor in order to build those buildings. So nobody has thought about their housing. And, you know, people are not realizing that if you do this, you're going to have this. And um, people are still not realizing that the economy does not take, uh, the cost of those apartments do not consider whether these people have toilets when they work and all the rest, all the basics. So this is one of the concerns I have. And the other is that Bombay, the Bombay I grew up in and graduated from, did not have this much of, um, you know, social segregation, although um, it's hard to measure this as a, as a citizen of that place. You, 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 you live there, you become numb to those realities. You don't, you, you don't see, you know, lots of people are living in slums. You don't measure it, so you can't uh, say whether it's grown or not. But of course, as an academic today, knowing all of those figures, I can say it's much worse. But what is also pers uh, you, you know, palpable is that a lot of areas have a much starker this differentiation in the urban form. You could not see, you know, the, the high rises growing and the slums spreading. This sort of a thing is happening everywhere. It's happening all over South America, all over Africa. So social segregation is a huge concern for me. And in Bombay, more than 50% are slum dwellers and pavement dwellers, more than 50%. That means the people who live in normal houses are the minority. So the fact is the world is increasingly getting that way. If you look at the urban age reports and city comparisons, this is happening everywhere. So these are most of my, this cover most of my concerns and the final one being the, materi the materials used to construct buildings. Even in India, uh, all those c cement and steel are not considered the highest energy, embodied energy, um, you know, contributors. This is still true for India because there's not enough cement and steel to cater to all its uh, demands. And it's become a vernacular material everywhere. But, um, but elsewhere, the people are using much more energy in the, um, in the actual embodied energy contained in the buildings. In the developed uh, countries, people are worried about the energy consumed to run buildings. They're not talking about this because in the pie chart, it looks like a small thing. But that's only because they use a lot more energy to run their buildings. It's not that they use less to build their buildings. It's just as they cut their energy, you know, as it gets more efficient, that piece is going to grow and reveal itself. So it's very important to look at it already in advance. Um, in India, we, um, as I said, we had a rich, we have replaced uh, all our rich tradition of building, all our building skills and everything with this kind of uh, what is now a vernacular material, reinforced cement concrete. Nothing against that, but when people don't have the knowledge to uh, build with reinforced concrete, usually they are badly made and they are very hard to fix. And on top of it, it has to be used judiciously. You can't make every single park bench in reinforced concrete when you know there's not enough to go around. People in big cities get them immediately, but in the rest of India and in smaller cities, you have to wait for long for the steel to appear and so on. So when I went to, um, when I went to, when I moved out of Bombay and I went to Oroville, I, it was a remote area and I automatically began to question material. So what I'm going to show today in uh, connection with the, what I've shown at the Venice Biennale is uh, all the research I've done with building materials categorized into broad sections. So I'm just taking you section by section. This one, um, the first table, uh, I, had, I had arranged these tables with research, uh, with, with material samples and so on. It's about live materials. Things I've done with wood, bamboo, thatch, everything that comes from trees, things that grow from the earth. So in contrast, you know, to all the life I had in Bombay, 
When I left it, um, I moved to Oroville and immediately started living like this. So it was, first of all, I was dealing with my own affordability issue on one hand. But on the other hand, I, um, I, I, wasn't plan I didn't know how long I would stay. And I thought that such a house, which can be built in a week, uh, could stay at least for two years. And I, I would be able to afford that. So I also was interested in round wood as opposed to timber, because I, I mean, the, the section of wood that if you cut uh, the thinnings of, uh, from a forest and you try to build with the whole wood uh, that you've cut, and it keeps, it gets, it, it tapers, and then there are areas that are thinner and, you know, th the sections that are bigger. If you use that, then uh, you get, you can use a very young tree, a two or three year old tree. Whereas if you cut it out, the same section out of a rectangle, uh, as a rectangle, then you need a much bigger uh, piece. Uh, you need the tree to grow. So this is a very basic um, sense I had that if we are going to grow our, be able to grow this resource and consume in that proportion, we'll have to research round wood structures. So this was my first house. I lived here with a single solar panel, and uh, it, I had a light bulb and a long cable, and I took the same bulb to various places so that I could have music as well. So it was, it was a direct uh, understanding of building and building infrastructure and trying to live as simply as possible, not only changing the demand side, not only changing the supply side, but also the demand, you know, working both ways and achieving a good life with very little resources. This experience actually taught me a lot and encouraged me to go on. So I, I must share this because this was my own house. And I, as I simplified my life, I only felt better and better. And I realized actually that a lot of things you have are not necessary. And then you have to, if you want to have, if you want to build with significantly less, you really need to know so that's why I put all my attention on knowledge and the building of knowledge. Because if you don't know engineering and you over-design everything like you see all around, uh, that's the first area we can save a lot. Is because if you have knowledge, you can use significantly less materials. So this house is as a com has a many, you know, it is not only made with casuarina wood. There's a kind of palm, something between palm and bamboo called pakamaram. It's a very local thing with which the floor is made. It's tied with rope which comes from the coconut. All of these are live materials. They've all grown. Um, uh, you know, there's the, the leaves are coconut. The ground floor was very simple like that. Later, I did a lot of things with, I was exploring there's, there's a whole study I did called Form Follows Technology, where I was looking at how technologies uh, enable what kind of forms and you know, what's the relationship between material choices, construction technologies, and engineering. So I did a few things like this um, at uh, environmentally sensitive locations where you can dismantle everything and, um, and leave nothing, like no trace of the fact that you had used this place to live. This was for a yoga center at Mulshi. This is, um, you know, the, the, the team of people who work on, with these materials traditionally. I have to say that most all the things I'm going to show are actually not traditional. I mean, they've, the, the, there are traditional skills, and sometimes uh, skills have been, you know, learned in the process. So it, it can be easily confused with vernacular architecture. But in this case, it is much more vernacular because uh, I had just got there and there, there were people building and living in these houses. I just designed it for my contemporary needs. But much later, I uh, have taken students from the AA here um, to have this kind of full-scale experience, you know, because I believe that in academia what I find missing is that people are disconnected from the reality. And I think, I think this, there's no need for academia. And I don't know why people accept that it's a given. I just don't get it. Because I really think that it's very important to be able to contribute back to life. You must never lose contact with it. And so I, take, I, I think that in design studios that I find 
um, the way it's being taught mostly everywhere is that people don't have the experience or contact to real materials, real scale, which I find very, very dangerous if people don't know how to visualize and only know what works in models, and then to real people and to real places. And I think I try to bring this opportunity in the design studio because I want them to confront these realities, be informed by those realities in the design and uh, process, and you know, keep, keep feeding this um, experiences that they have, the real um, learning experiences, not just learning, but learning experience, experiencing knowledge and uh, imbibing it and then drawing out of that. So this was an example for a watchtower in a botanical garden. So in 10 days, it was possible to design. It was a design competition, 12 students, 12 designs um, made directly through models and then choosing one building it together, and, and I always, um, you know, have this sort of a scenario in my projects or in my teaching where there are students, there are professionals, there are artisans, there are, you know, everyone, engineers, everyone who needs to be there are there together, and they're not, there are no walls between them. So I find that that is interesting for, for everyone to, to go further with what they know. So this is what those students produced with people who had no hands-on experience with building, you know, but with the support of craftsmen and just in, in as few days as 10 days, a lot of building in full scale is possible. The second, uh, there were, I meant to have a divider here to uh, go to the next section of um, fired clay, you know, this has come out of place. Sorry, I'm confused. Um, so yeah, so here you see the similar kind of materials um, entering some other type of houses, but continuing with a kind of hybrid um, kind of thing. Because people, a lot of people start wanting to have this kind of house, having contact to nature, but not ready to go all the way. So, you know, there are some kind of um, applications, but here again you see that the coconut thatch is not attached on wood. It's attached, it's, it's uh, supported by GI wires. So there's a kind of uh, introduction of something a little more high-tech because that's what makes sense in that project. And the whole thing is supported more lightly. Next uh, series of explorations involve earth. It, uh, covers fired earth, terracotta, rammed earth, baked in situ mud houses. So one of the things I started researching is when people make bricks in factories versus when people make bricks in, in a kind of, uh, in the countryside, you know, the, the high quality brick versus the, what we, what we call, um, floor molded, not table, not table molded. They are not level. They are all made on the field and so on. So you know, ever since Louis Kahn came to India and built all those amazing buildings, I, we have been always chasing, and you know that from all our schools, we are always chasing the proper brick. You know, we want to find the industrial brick. Now it's the industrial brick which actually is uh, considered, uh, you know not so environmental friendly, it consumes a lot of energy, it needs to be, you know, coal needs to be burnt, etc. So people in the green rating systems, they've, they've just, they don't have anything to do with the quality of energy, they just consider the quantity of energy. That, you, that was bothering me. And so bricks were considered um, like the bad material. But, they, but I found out that actually they mean the industrial brick because the local brick is actually part of the landscape on the, of the territory of how things are made, what kind of clay is available. It's, you know, they are weak, I realized, and the more I found out, the more I started realizing that the bad brick is the good brick, actually, because the, the bricks that are made in this way, just like they were made in Mohenjo-daro and Harappa 3,800 years ago, those are made very, very locally, and they may not reach that kind of um, strength, but it's possible to use it for a lot of things. So, I mean, that was my first encounter with brick. And I realized in the way these bricks are made, 
not factory made bricks, I mean local ovens, these are also the things with which they cook those bricks are also part of the cycle of what they grow. So the casuarina with which I built my house is the same that you see here. These, are, these come out of plantations that are grown where the thinnings are used as fuel. And um, this is part of an activity which is interspersed within their agricultural cycle and so on. So I realized by being more sensitive to the territorial you know, activities that it's not good to displace everything overnight. So I started researching lime kilns, brick kilns and all of that and realized that, you know, just because you come out of school, subscribe, you just specify Portland cement because that's what we are taught because that's a standard thing. Um, and there again, we need to know less because everything is standard. You don't need to know the clay won't differ, the lime won't differ. It's easy, standardized. So we just don't realize that all of these people and their activity are, is, is displaced too easily. So I did this house, when I moved out of that hut I showed you, I made this house to, by reviving that type of brick. Actually, this brick is not the same size as the one I showed before. It's like the Roman bricks that are still made in Tamil Nadu. There were different sizes still available. There were, in the bullock cart radius, you could get all sorts of brick sizes. According to, you could hold it easily in your hand. It's not heavy. It, uh, it, it, it allow, allowed for fine work. It's about one inch thick, these bricks. So I wanted to put it out, exposed, even though it's a very tropical kind of area. So this house was made mostly with that brick, even the roof, the floor, I mean here. This is the wall house. And then I've used these bricks in several other houses. So, you know, the houses are contemporary, but the thinking and the material, um, you know, the processes involved are more sensitive. Um, because usually there's this notion that if you do things uh, in the old way, you know, it, it's, they, or they, or there's always, I, I want to really have a discussion one day about what is vernacular, really. Because, um, you know, there's, E easily people call, now if they see certain images, they'll call it contemporary and some others will be vernacular, you know. So um, there's a lot of thing, a lot of ideas to be dismantled there. But anyway, mostly in these houses, there's a lot of this natural, the, the way the outside comes in and so on. But I'm just showing um, some of the architecture that has been built with these kind of materials. This is a very... Uh, low-cost library in Pondicherry that we are just about finishing right now. The good thing about brick is that it can be left without plaster and paint. So all those materials can be redundant because if fungus is going to grow anyway, it better grow on the brick than on the white painted walls because it's much more visible and it, people can't afford to maintain their buildings and paint them each year. So here I'm moving on to terracotta where it's basically the same material, fired clay. And um, in the first house that I did, my, the, my very first project for a Frenchman, I, I was already living in that hut and I realized that when I would visit friends in their proper pakka houses, I realized that actually th those houses, those concrete roofs, actually made the house much more uncomfortable than my own thatch hut. So I already started thinking about, I thought I, I have to have some alternative roof. I can't be um, contributing to building and creating more problems than there were when you didn't have the house. So I, I came to this um, choice because I, that area, I had seen a lot of potters in that region who try to sell pots habitually and hardly find buyers. So I knew that those skills were available and I tried to find a way to build roofing systems that would require hardly any steel at all. Because as I said, in a rural area, we had to wait for a long time for the steel to arrive and delay, it would delay the construction. So at that time, it was not so much of a low cost 
quest. It was more about, you know, building with what is locally available. And in order to communicate with the craftsmen and all of that, I was already working in one-to-one -one so that they would understand what was going on and be able to help me because I was nervous as it was my first project. So you can see, uh, like, I didn't know a lot of things. And I realized that actually you don't have to know something in order to do it. I mean, you can't wait till you know it. If you don't start doing it, you'll never find out in the process. So I, I felt like it's important if you're curious about something, you have to embark on a project with it. And that's the only way you will get the answers in the process. So I already began with the first project, trying to give this kind of a roof, working with the craftspeople, and realizing in the process that the way they produce these, these terracotta, you know, elements with, with local bio waste and so on, with the help of Ray Mika, a Californian ceramist who was there locally, I managed to get much better strength and mu much more of a finesse and a standard, uh, you know, quality, you know, uh, element with the same people because we made very invisible changes in the design. We actually, this was designed and uh, made it's not a local, locally existing way of making roofs. We just diverted the skills they had to, towards buildings, in, you know, because their products would land up only in the museum otherwise. So with this, like here you see coconut shells, etc., are used for firing these pots. So the first house that I did, and that's what, I, what came out of the Frenchman's house, you know, th this is the architecture that I produced with that, with ferro-cement fins, insulated walls and roofs. It looked, uh, you know, I'd still come out of straight from Bombay and I had this kind of aesthetic sense and that's what I did. And at that time people uh, said that it had a Bauhaus influence and whatever, you know. And immediately when I did the next house, where I, all I did was remove the plaster because it, of that fungus problem, immediately they called it vernacular. And that's why I'm mentioning this, because I think people are rapidly jumping to conclusions um, about materials and, you know, feeding the, their own, you know, the, the stereotypical ideas about, about uh, these things. So anyway, this was... Um, quite a big project for me. And, and the only thing I'd ask the client to agree to was the roof. And I said, I'll compromise anywhere. Let me just do this roof. So um, you see the roof again repeated 10 years later in my own house. So in this, in this space, you can see that you know, it's very durable. The first house that I've done is 25 years old already. So. It's tried and tested. And I went on to thinking about other systems that you can see there in the left-hand corner of how terracotta could work as loss shuttering and resolve these RCC roofs and make them more efficient. So this is the quality of the house. The bedroom that sticks out of the wall. And I, I was very happy to find out that uh, when I had to do a very low-cost housing project with very, very, very little, like it cost $3,000 per house, you know, I found out that this roof was still the cheapest thing as well. So sometimes, so the concern for affordability came a bit later on for me. Um, it was mostly about affor affordability in environmental terms before in economic terms. So, um, so you find actually a lot of people using these techniques now also in that area. And this is the other roof I'm going to cover here. See, people in small towns cannot afford form work and uh, good quality shuttering to make their concrete um, smooth enough not to require plaster just to hide the flaws. On the other hand, all efficient RCC constructions use, overuse flat slabs, etc. over design them because form work is very expensive. So if you were to do diagrid slabs, waffle slabs and so on, people um, hesitate to introduce those kind of complicated form work. So I tried to use the terracotta 
as lost shuttering, building on the work that was already done by Laurie Baker, but increasing the effective depth by having deeper pots. So through this method, I was able to, first of all, I had started employing a lot more people in the building, and a bigger chunk of my budget used to go to the people, less to the uh, materials, more to the uh, labor. And local labor. So those were done those days intuitively and not because I knew it's a good strategy, but then it kept growing and I realized how important it is to think about what, even if the same, if, you're, if the budget is exactly the same, which one are you choosing? You know, if, if two things cost the same, I go for the one that's going to spend much more of its money on the people directly. So it's always a good thing. And uh, so here, you know, you see what's involved and you see how little steel is involved. You know, every, normally every 10 or 15 centimeters, there would be another steel bar, if not two. And um, in this case, every 45 or so. So that was the kind of saving that was involved. This is, of course, in this wall house, all these technologies were tested but they were designed for the larger halls and not having a beam at the edge, not having beams inside the hall allows the hot air to escape. And there are many other, it's an in, you know, integrated solution for many other concerns. So lots of big span structures were solved that way. And this one, for instance, is again a hand extruded um, system that goes together with a partly prefabricated concrete rib, and it's like a kind of insulated jack arch system that was also tested in the wall house. Um, and there you see another rammed earth wall being tested as well. Because, you know, nobody would let you test on their projects. And I, I had to do all that research, you know, without the research funding. When I said uh, practice, research-oriented practice, it meant where do you get the funds from? So uh, all that was done in my own, on my own usually, and then applied. So then this is a workshop for um, t technical skills. This is another housing project, three-story high. And this is, again, the test of the, uh, see, the, the ceiling in the wall house, the first prototype tested here for that housing project elsewhere. The rammed earth wall tested here to train, not only to test how it works, but to train all those people who are going to actually be able to go elsewhere and make those houses. Now, the thing is about this rammed earth is, again, it's not a traditional way of doing it. In fact, there's no rammed earth in that area because of the monsoon. This is a 5% cement stabilized rammed earth, and it looks like concrete. It has a very modern aesthetics. It's a monolithic piece that can... Uh, you can build one wall per day with four people. And people are more and more, uh, as I went along, I, I try to choose technologies where people could participate in their construction and reduce costs if they wanted to. So, uh, so that's how my architectural preferences developed as I uh, involved, I, I became more, uh, people became more important in my projects. So this is that housing project. Here in this one, we had, uh, we've, in all of these projects, actually we are treating the wastewater, um, you know, harvesting rainwater and all of that. In Oroville, a lot of projects already were very highly ecological and, you know, there's a lot of prototypes for such things. These, again, the low cost end, here, sometimes, in very low-cost projects, I see, you know, depending on exactly how much you can save, sometimes you have brick parapets with rammed earth walls because you don't have enough money to buy another form work and so on. So, now I'm going to explain the baked in situ mud house. So, what it, as I told you, it's about building a mud house and cooking the whole thing in situ. Ray Meeker, who developed this uh, who pioneered this whole technology and made it work. He had, this is one of his tests, he used to build various kiln models to be able to find out what is efficient. And inside the house, 
that he would cook, he would actually fire various other terracotta pro products that are required in the houses, whether they are tiles, pipes, wash basins, uh, WCs, and so on. So I found, found this to be a very, very interesting technology because it's like if you take the fire to the building site instead of taking the bricks to the industry for firing, I wanted to measure what kind of socioeconomic differences uh, come about. And that's why I did my PhD on that. Uh, and after finishing the PhD, I wanted to test one more structure for fuel efficiency and so on. And so that's why this orphanage project was made. And then you have students um, involved in this project because, you know, I've always tried to bring, share um, this immediately with the people, you know, through workshops and so on. And so here you see that what they're doing is that the students are stacking bricks and we have to leave room for the oxygen to enter. So it's very complex, it's very complex, but the interesting advantage is that you literally buy no material because except for the fuel and depending on where you get it from, this is actually all clay and everything is labor. It's almost 100% labor. There is of course the fuel. In this case, we used um, coal dust from factories we, from when you sweep the floor from you know, um, other furnaces, you get this kind of coal dust and we'd mixed it into the brick. So the brick burnt out of its own fuel. So these are very, very difficult experiments. And um, then the house cooks for about three or four days. And the whole thing, you know, it has to reach 980 degrees centigrade. And then if everything went well, then you have those red bricks inside. And, you know, typical kilns, they waste 40% of the energy that they generate into their own walls again and again and again and again. So that's the heat that Ray Meeker wanted to tap. And then he solved all this complex kiln technologies. So, um, you know, I think this is a, I still hope that somebody will take it up and, you know, take it further. Because I think it has a huge potential uh, to be, to, uh, to deliver a, a mud, a, a brick house for the price of a mud house and involving no cement because the whole thing is cemented by fire. So, and then you produce. So, you know, the house becomes a producer of building materials, not a consumer of building materials. It just feeds the local economy with the products it generates. So, to wrap up the terracotta or the fired uh, clay section, I'm going to show you what I, images of what I did in Venice when David Chipperfield invited me to the Biennale four years ago. And because uh, Venice is such a brick city, you see the different types of bricks that were patched, uh, you know, different bricks from different times show the socioeconomic changes in, you know, now you can't get bricks like these even. You, you have, in Venice, you have very different kind of bricks with which you have to do repairs. It's the hollow, kind of tall, big piece. So, you know, this was the space given to me in the Arsenale, and it was interesting because the brick that you saw was only revealed because of the fact that it's a building in ruins, but then there are terracotta tiles, and the whole city is about firing clay. So I decided to situate the wall house inside that because the theme was common ground, and I wanted to show that we are more common then we are different. And that actually, it's, the, it's just in our perception, all this division and all of that. We are all the same across the planet. According to the geographical conditions, we are slightly different and the cultural context. So this, this was, again, to strengthen the importance of architecture being a full-scale thing to be experienced by inhabiting spaces with a full-scale body and not, you know, because of the over-emphasis now on those renderings and whatever uh, help us to write about architecture also without even visiting those places and all of that. So I wanted to discuss all those issues by building a full-scale project and show that only in full-scale does everything that architecture involves um, get represented in the right balance. If not, it's either too much about material, too much about form, and all, the, all those things. So most of all, I wanted to show that the building that looked perfectly f designed for, Ven uh, for South India 
could seamlessly belong to not only Venice, but to the Arsenale. And people couldn't tell between this and that. Um, you know, and, and you know, even the roof, the, the terracotta roof and the one below, with much less support, with, with no support. That shows that we, are, we have advanced. But even the arch and the vault, you see the same profile at the back is exactly the same catenary curve. So in this corner here on the left, you know, this, there are pieces that I made in other materials to keep testing. This was all made with wine bottles since we were in Italy. We didn't drink all that. Uh, so, but it involved, um, again, a mix of people. It was relatively made, uh, mostly made by students, the whole thing in six weeks. So people who came with us could learn the whole process of architecture from design to construction. Everything was designed in a manner that students would be able to do them. And then all the material came authentically from India because I was, David had asked whether I wanted to do it outside in the garden. Um, because um, Alvaro Siza was the other person who had who an architect who had done a house and it was located outside. And I was, I knew that it, I told him no, I want it in, in, in the inside because I want to exhibit this architecture in full scale. But I want to exhibit it and it's not, it would not make sense for Venice. It, so it was deliberately placed inside and lit as an exhibited piece. And uh, you know, the, there were craftsmen who came in from India. So we had all of these people Together, the engineer was from Australia. I was in Australia at that time. So we had 20 students from there, 10 students from Italy, six Indian craftsmen, and we managed to build that together. So then I'm moving on to stone. So, you know, one of the skills that are disappearing in India, but not only are they disappearing, it's also that this community doesn't have enough work because of social transition. So they used to make, there's a village that in South India where they made grinding stones for grinding our chutneys and masalas. So now with the mixer that every villager has, since we have electricity, even though it's not at all reliable, we uh, have, nobody buys those grinding stones, but these people know how to level them perfectly flat by hand. And so I wanted to do a project um, with that. And I wanted to, see whether through contemporary use of these skills, if these skills could go on on one hand, on the other hand, we could uh, you know, question some of the uses of stone we have now because they all get factory polished and all that. All these hotel lobbies are made of polished granite reflecting all the light from the ceiling. And you know, it's very, very, it doesn't feel like stone anymore. So I wanted to use this and, in, um, pro and, and this what you see here, that was made with the whole, the whole flooring which was undulating was made by hand leveling these stone slabs. And some of them are not leveled and that's how there's a keystone and two pieces leaning against each other. So this was a contemporary store idea, but it was just a two week exhibition. And all these pieces, it, they, it was supposed, the brief was to, it was not about affordability at all. They told me to talk about luxury because they, they, I had to make statements about luxury, and I, I had, and in order not to contradict myself, and to care for the for the social equity, I, I defined luxury as having more time than you need, that you can actually have the time to cook if it takes a whole day, make a sari if it weave a sari for four m months, take time to do things well and to do things yourself. That is luxury to have more time than you need, to have more space than you need. So. That's a common definition, everybody can agree to it. The, the poor, the rich, everybody wants more time than they have. So the good thing about this was, it was spoken about a lot because they said, why are you taking all this trouble for just two weeks? And, and, I, and I realized that the most of the waste produced is in exhibitions because they do things with tacky materials and with wood in a way that you can't reuse them and so on. And this was a modular system and it was just in the dry gravel standing in that bed of other little chips of granite. And when you finished, you just took everything away and we gave it to other people or sold it or whatever. So there was no waste at all. And 
why shouldn't a thing take time to make if it is just for two weeks? Why? Because if it's, it was, there was a big budget, and that budget went to those, craft, those craftsmen, you know. So we, we decided that, but, but again, it was important. This store was, it was called Made in India, uh, curated by people in Milan. It was, um, it's going to, it's a part of a series going to take place in many countries. The idea is that uh, if the luxury sector affords to pay those craftsmen well, not, not just somehow, you know, that's the only way those skills will continue. That was the message to be given. So all the products you see are handmade, they are, and they had to be contemporary. So I wanted to set it in a space that is contemporary, um, and uh, you know, so on. But similarly, also a lot of other houses that. Um, you know, with, with random stone masonry that you find more and more, like you find areas with a lot of stone, but people say that they don't want to do it because it's, people have forgotten how to work with non-standard material. So I'm working with stone in various forms, but I haven't got too many examples there because I really want to talk a bit more about urban waste. It's a growing unending section. I just started with one thing and another thing, and I just see more and more opportunities for building with urban waste. You know, in the, in the orphanage I showed you, there was already there that I began the urban waste thing by using bicycle wheels, by using, you know, uh, some of them might be here. So it's funny that I show books here, but I, was, uh, I discovered that books is actually one of the biggest urban waste areas that nobody talks about because people feel very shocked and people are in denial about the fact that books are burnt regularly. Libraries, people, it's very expensive to store books. So on one hand, people have smaller attention span and are reading less, but uh, on the other hand, overprinting. There's, I don't know what it is, but there's a lot of books that, uh, in Australia, where this picture is, it's mostly pulped. In Spain, it's burnt and so on. I, it's, it's incredible how much, um, how much there is to do with books. It's the reason I began inquiring this, uh, I, researching books, was because I was invited to Barcelona to build a, a pavilion expressing liberty. And I thought of um, talking about the idea of knowledge making you free, because there, Catalonia wants to be independent, and I didn't want to go in the political way. So I wanted to focus on knowledge again. And I found out, I thought it would be nice if it's built with books, because if people are not reading, like, let it haunt them, you know? So I went, I uh, had Iak as my partner, who, who mostly do a lot of uh, robo robotic, digital kind of, uh, you know, inquiries. But even they do their prototypes by hand, and they, a lot of things cannot be done if students didn't work on those actual models with real materials and so on. So it was a good partner for us, and we did a couple of workshops, you know, and found out we had to demystify what a book is and look at it just as an object and just make, do things with it. It was very, very difficult for me to build with books, the idea of building with books, because it's, you've, or everybody starts reading them, and only now when it's not supposed to be read. <laughs> so, you know, we tried all these things. Very interesting. If you fold alternate pages, it's just not going to fall. There's no glue or anything. We discovered a uh, lot of things like that. So, um, there was another exhibition at that time in Madrid where I was questioning the library, the future of the library in, in the city to know what happens when people don't read books or go to libraries for exchanging books, what should the house of knowledge be or how, you know, so there was a, there was a design project, design studio, two-week workshop in the exhibition space, and I wanted them, al always I want them to do something in full scale, so I told them that imagine in this utopian imaginary country there's nothing but what is in the basement. And they had books, of, of course. They have old catalogs which they don't need. So everything we did here, everything they made, all the models, everything was only using books. So, and they had to make one full-scale thing. This is just one of the examples of what they did that was also exhibited is 
this is a sofa by just using the soft, the movable thing in, in the vertical face. So it, it's not a rigid element, but if you use it as a seat, it's the hardest thing. So, you know, it's just like this, made like this, bunches of pages folded. This, all of this happens only when you start. That's what I mean to say that if students can't work with their hands, if they cannot think with their hands, they, they exclude a whole area of imagination. Very important, because if you were just to design, you would only draw what you already experienced. You would never have a new experience. So for me, it's very important that in a design school, the imagination has to be developed as much as knowledge and skills. All the three have to be developed. So these kind of, like urban waste is a very good thing because they're so surprised that they look at it in a new way than if you would give them a brick, for, for example. So what I did is, um, for the actual pavilion in Barcelona, by then, I had been seeing this plastic a lot. Probably it influenced me because of the ham that they keep serving, those vacuum-packed Iberico, jamón, serrano, and all of that. So I realized that, you know, I wanted to also make an artistic statement that to extend the life of the book like the ham, you know, to vacuum-pack it, also to make it rigid, and to forcibly, you forcibly open it, um, you know, to show that the books are not being read. And then we made a canopy out of it. And then this canopy was, you know, there, are no, there aren't enough uh, shaded spaces in all of these squares. So this is a filmoteca in the Raval district where we did this. Also, all these trees are cut to make books. So if you're not reading, make the trees back, you know? So that was a bit the idea and um, this is one project that, you know, I always try that you don't detect the material because it has to go beyond its uh, recognizing it, then it's successful. This is another example with Tetra Pak. Tetra Pak is a very complex thing to um, dismantle because it has four layers that are different materials. <clears throat> it's a very complicated thing. So when people want to recycle it, they just use many more chemicals and just press it together and make boards. And so what I've done here is I've, uh, I thought that it's such a complex material made to be waterproof. So why not fill it back with water or sand and just use it as a brick? So with this, we did a project in Mexico City. It was a workshop, two-day workshop. And that's what we produced. We took a Eladio Dieste type of wall so that it'll be structurally stable. So st students get a chance to work with the real weight of the brick even if it's something else than a brick. Like in this case, it was for the hay festival in Segovia. And here, these water bottles, actually you can see that they have got the individual water bubbles, so you can also measure the levels with it. But this was for distributing water because of climate change and discussions about how the importance of clean water reaching people. So with, that water, with the water that would have to be stacked, we did an installation so that by the end of it, we could just have nothing left there for after the opening. So this is the bicycle wheels used as form work in the orphanage that I showed you, the fired house, and bottles, glasses. Sometimes if you buy materials from the domestic sector, they are much more reasonable than from the material ma manufacturers because you could not have bought with this project uh, those you know, because they are made in a certain way that it becomes so expensive. So I, I, I look, I buy materials from any sector, you know. I don't immediately go to the material catalog. And now the next project I'm going to do, which is not yet, um, the workshop is going to be in Ahmedabad uh, for Archie Pri. Um, it's an international student competition that they have. And I'm going to look at textile manufacturer's waste. And so we are going to look at tensile structures and other things that can be made with fabric. And finally, the last thing is ferrocement. It's a material I've been working on in order to, like I said, use significantly less materials. So uh, it's different from reinforced cement concrete in the sense that it uses chicken mesh instead of large diameter steel. and the a uh, whole ferrocement element must not be more than one inch. It, has, it can be less. The moment it becomes thicker than that, it'll have the 
you know, bending stresses, etc. And then it, it'll need to become, it'll start behaving like reinforced concrete and then the, the self-weight of the structure will be more than, you know, so that cycle that happens, you know, with reinforced concrete. So ferrocement is a material that Fry Auto used a lot, um, uh, sorry, developed forms for, but um, Nervi promoted in the 40s. And for some reason it has not, I think the potential is uh, not really exploited. So I've been always working with ferrocement. But one of the projects I'm going to show you is looking at um, crease patterns developed in origami structures and looking at how that could lead to not only rigid forms, um, because ferrocement has to, the form carries, gives it strength. So it's very interesting for architects to, um, uh, you know, try to, you know, whenever the span is not, I mean, if it's not standing, you just have to introduce more folds. So it's very interesting for the form generation aspect, but also I felt that I would be able to look at the form work and use recycled cartons, have forms that completely collapse, maybe for disaster relief or other uses, you can just go and open the thing, have your ferro cement arriving in with those creases and see with very little steel, you can have structures like that. So these are projects which are not really in the mainstream, but they've been tested in full scale. And I'm very interested in working with ferro cement um, as an affordable housing solution. In many contexts, it's relevant. Um, here, for instance, I'm exploring how prefab elements can be made in ferro cement. The previous one was about whole surfaces where you don't need walls and roofs and separate elements, but light elements which hardly need a foundation. This one is, uh, the idea is to do a prefab system, modular system, where all your belongings fit into the, into the folds that you need to make. And the house can be assembled in four or five days and can be not, these are not made, uh, conceived as uh, factory-made elements, but made in the houses of uh, villagers uh, who, village masons, who have always the opportunity to make a little extra money in the weekends, etc., and teach people around them at the same time. So that's, um, it's something that I'm hoping to, you know, to really take onto the mainstream because I'm, I'm astonished at how affordable this can be and how quickly houses could be delivered. So this house was first tested in Chennai as a prototype. And we used all these colors to highlight the voids that are actually storage spaces. You know, you don't need anything here, doors, windows, everything's made out of ferro cement. Kitchens are incorporated, bathroom, uh, toilet bowls, wash basins, everything's incorporated. The colors are like stucco also embedded. You will not have to paint anything. And all of this has been developed as a very simple solution. This is the separate toilet that goes with that. And then there's also the built-in version. This was exhibited in London in Roka recently. In fact, it's in Zaha Hadid's space. The day before Zaha passed away, in fact, was the opening. And, um, and then the same project that I've, you know, the modular house and the toilet is what I brought to this year's Biennale. And after showing this, I'll end with that. The topic was reporting from the front. I decided to discuss the, you know, the battle theme idea that Alejandro had introduced by saying reporting from the front and the fact that it, it's a battle now for, for a better living environment. I, I wanted to go uh, address the issue of battle itself because I feel that the, the duality happens when you don't integrate them. And I think architects are very good at synthesizing everything. And I think the duality, all these opposites, like have to be brought together to avoid the battle and to enrich the, the process and the product. So on one, what I did is I put the main objects, the house and the toilet, but on the other side, and this, this the straight axis, you walk through the house and you go out of, uh, you walk through the house and you go alongside the same, you know, those who know the Arsenal space will understand. So I placed the duality 
that exists in architecture, the spatial research on one side through models, and the material research on the other side. Usually people talk about one or another aspect, but don't realize that the architecture is in the designing the void, and the material is only there to hold it and shape it. And therefore, it doesn't matter with what material, you, one should not have fetishes about that. One should use materials that make sense and focus on the space to define what kind of architecture you want to have, because that's the part that the people are going to use. So I arranged this that way. And there was a lot of space around to search, look at things, although Venice is not quite the right place because there's so much to see, it's like a trade fair. I, I still used this as an opportunity for me to do all this work and sort out my archives and put the inventory together. So that's why I'm very happy to present it and explain it because I'm not sure there how many people would have actually seen all the things that are here. There's one object, one installation here called Live Knowledge where all these hashtags were introduced and live tweets every 30 seconds about housing and affordability and so on appear. So you can sit on those benches and, you know, dwell on all the issues that I'm concerned about. And I can myself sit there and listen to the voices. So here you see the wash basin and everything. The whole thing has been recreated exactly in full scale so that people can actually, because seeing is believing. When they see the quality of space, then they believe that, you know, this could work. So here you see all these different themes I spoke about. There's a lot of research on colors, on pigments, on cements, all types of cements, uh, high tech and low tech. There are three patches in the ferro cement where there are six original ferro cement pieces made in Germany. And um, you know, the opportunity of the exhibition was used to push the knowledge further. So that's what I want to say that every project is an opportunity to build more knowledge. And what we did here is we worked with TU Berlin, with Mike Schleich and Arndt Goldach, and we looked at whether glass fiber, carbon fiber, jute, and all of these other materials could improve the strength in ferrocement and test all the different properties. Here you see even the culture of building was addressed because these are trowels, the Indian trowels and the German one. You know, obviously, which one is which. Um, for, the, for making the same right angle. So the, the craftspeople from India went to Germany, built... See, this, this is what all happens in the process that one does an exhibit. The process is that there's a knowledge exchange. And all those elements that are made naturally by the Indians in their own you know, way of doing it is then tested. And it was, they were so surprised to see the strength. Look at the way it doesn't break. It, it's so ductile. And so now this is going to become a, you know, the research has gained a lot from this. Uh, so it was not just a mere production of an exhibition. We have actually taken the knowledge further. The rest of the elements in this um, pro uh, prototype were built by recycling the previous Art Biennale's wood from the German pavilion. So first I've looked at the moment I was invited, what kind of waste people are going to produce and then choose the one appropriate. And then with, with another organization, I've been looking at what kind of um, homeless peoples and what kind of needs they have, et cetera, with an organization that helps them. Uh, and with Ray Biennale, the people who are going to recycle with us now after, on the 27th, we are going to dismantle this. I'm going to Venice, we're going to dismantle this, take more students with us, do a workshop there on reassembling this elsewhere so that whatever we produce is useful on many, many levels. So everybody, like there have been three batches of workshops in the production of it, but you know, in Germany, the engineers were involved. Here, the people who are you know, getting more socially sensitive, et cetera. And, and of course, Madrid students went there to construct it. So with this, I would like to conclude that um, the, with my sketch that I gave Aravena before he gave me that spot to show that the projects that you see are the fruits of the tree, but the knowledge, the quest for knowledge is actually what, is, uh, what results in that kind of projects. For, and I wanted to display all this as an inventory and all, it, it gave me the opportunity to explain that even it's always worth investing in knowledge 
because if you have the knowledge, like if the roots are fine, even if the tree collapses in a storm, it will definitely survive. Whereas if you just work on the upper superficial level and things change, you, have to, you don't know how to reinvent yourself continuously. So it's better to invest in, we, we are really living in times where we need a lot more knowledge to, to, to take, to divert, you know, the, to, to move in a more healthy direction. And I think um, even the battles that he talks about can only be solved even if the knowledge way takes much more time. It took me 25 years to do all of this. So it's still worth it. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was just totally fascinating and a really great um, kind of introduction to your work and also I think uh, kind of um, introduction to a different way of thinking and approaching and a different set of uh, uh, circumstances and environments in the broad um, sense of the word. We're going to have a brief discussion. I invite you to okay. sit over here. Well, just uh, very briefly because I know that Students are getting antsy with Thanksgiving around the corner, but we'll also give you um, a chance to ask uh, a few questions. So, I don't know. These on? Okay. <laughs> so I am gonna ask you, so what is vernacular? But first, <laughs> I'm very interested in what you said about architecture as an instrument and this idea that you share the knowledge that you've gained with a very wide variety of people. Can you speak a little bit about how, um, on the one hand, you sort of ended with a fairly sophisticated test of tensile strength in the ferrocement, and one could imagine that with the connections that um, Schley has, that there could yeah. be all sorts of commercial products that might result from that. So that's one kind of side that I think is a more direct, understandable line from an academic research point of view and what you do in your mm -hmm. workshops. When you work with more local people, how do you, what, it, what would you like to see happen with what it is that you discover working with them? Because it's a mutual discovery, isn't it? I mean, you redeploy yeah. their skills, their, you know, their, not necessarily heritage, but like the way that you mm -hmm. kind of reinvent what it is, the artifacts that they produce. Um, is it possible that, you know, without the guidance of the architect uh, leading it, that, that you leave them with something that they can then bring to their community or develop um, in a kind of, I don't know if it's in an entrepreneurial way or how do you sort of see that yeah, I knowledge? Think first of all, uh, the thing I've, that most concerns me is that even what they know could be lost in mm -hmm. no time. So the first thing is to encourage them and value, because I, I know that what they know how to do, just like when we know how to stitch a button or knit, uh, and I therefore don't mean only craftsmen, I mean in general, the, the fact that we knew how to make things, or when you see the kind of smoking embroidery and the people are ab were able to do, every grandmother knew how to do all of that, that's all mathematical and that's, a lot of knowledge in there, and it was developed over generations. So to lose that, just like that, you know, is, is really worrying. Secondly, my second worry is that architects do not know about those things because they get um, often formed, they get so disconnected from those realities. Many of them living in very urban areas don't get to see what kind of, what range of skills there actually are. And um, because they get used to using, consuming products that are all made differently. So what happens is that they undervalue those things. And so what happens is when architects give them instructions, and that's what I saw in rural areas, the, architect, the craftsman feels very small. He mm -hmm. feels like they, the, the architect feels that it's always the fault of the craftsman who was not able to make it. And many times, it is because the architect doesn't know how to convey, he doesn't know. There are, there are shortcomings on both sides, but often being guided by architects who are not aware of this as an equal capacity as theirs, I think what happens is there has been a great degradation of the skills. People 
are not necessarily doing good work all the time and also not being guided well enough. So all of this has to be preserved, first of all. But I think, um, unfortunately, because they are also badly paid mm. and they are on a different social level, this is another thing that concerns me. So I think, um, I think more than, I'm not attached to, like for instance, in the case of the potters, I'm not attached to the pot. I don't mind if it goes extinct at all. I'm not a nostalgic type of person. But I'm worried about the potter, <laughs> if how he's going to survive, and about our society, if we've forgotten how to ever stitch a button, ever, nobody knows anymore how to do it. How's, what is the difference that makes to our mind? That's something that I But is there about. not, is there, um, I mean, the, the risk is that when you finish a project that it can't, the knowledge that's gained can't be propagated. Is there, does it happen in the situations that you're working in that, that the knowledge gained somehow can then go to be carried by the craftsmen? Do they, uh, It know? does get propagated, actually. I think it always does get propagated. I think even if one child learns to stitch one button, then he'll be able to stitch all those other buttons, you know? Because he'll have, he'll just first of all know that it can be done. So what happens is, uh, it may not go elsewhere, geographically, if those craftsmen mm -hmm. don't move, or I don't move, or other people are doing the same thing in their own way too. But at, it matters for that mm. place. So in that place, those people, I mean, they're all getting better paid. They are in demand. Everybody wants to hire them. But that's what I mean. Like that you, so so you've, you've kind of raised the bar, so to speak. I wouldn't take the credit uh, alone. I think I, I, I wouldn't really because it's really I don't think so. I think maybe they would do something else. And, you know, but I mean, I feel I gain from the fact that the things I value go on longer. Mm. And I think if... See, the fact that people are appreciating this and that you've invited me here and there's a kind of, you know, uh, a lo lot of people are looking for this kind of thing today, but I was looking for it many years ago. So what I mean is that it is still satisfying because uh, when you know, if you know that the, the habitual way of doing things is not good enough, it's impossible to do it that way. <laughs> you know, some people can still take up jobs uh, that they don't believe in, but I think then it's like, it's not like living anymore, you yeah. know, I think. So I think in any case, I wouldn't take all the credit, but I do think that people like well-made things. Well, I think it's interesting, the, the trajectory that you took your lecture through and ending on the Venice Biennale and on sophisticated, you know, collaboration with a sophisticated engineering company in, in Berlin, because it's sort of, I mean, I was questioning at first, like, how do you, how do you apply some of this knowledge that you've learned? How do you teach the students in Madrid? Is it about them going to work in other parts of the world, or are you asking them to interrogate their own environment, their own ways of making? And the app, the re sort of application of the technology that you were, you know, encountered because of very different circumstances in India somehow are still relevant. Yes. In, in Europe having to do with waste, having to do with embodied energy yeah. and, and all of those issues. I think what is important is not the, the, the exact questions I asked. It's important to ask questions and it's important to be convinced about what one is doing. And I think if the right questions are asked, then the student projects become more, more authentic. And uh, so I don't, I don't want to teach in a manner of, of, you know, I don't want them to be like me, obviously. Um, I think teaching, teaching has come about because I think uh, that learning has been happening, you know, in my environment, when, in all of this, on the site, in wherever, whether it was in Venice, there's a lot of learning happening and that's attractive. So it attracts academia, you know, to that. And I think... Um, it's what is important is like what you mentioned the high tech aspect in Berlin. The problem is that if uh, the the a lot of the affordability problem has to do with the fact that all the materials that are in the norms and standardized are all of that process happened after industrialization and only those kind of things have been sanctioned. So if you try to do something 
that existed. This happened only, this happened only for the last 100 years or less. Before that, everything else was locally, like people knew their clays, they knew their, you know. Today, it's, you know, people are hiding behind the norms. But the fact is, people who would go and work with a clay that they don't, I mean, they don't know the difference between this clay and that, they would be very insecure to do to that. So they are basically hiding the fact that they don't know how to do it and therefore they are afraid. But they say, no, no, this is not allowed and that's not allowed. The fact is, <laughs> why, why is Mike Schleich able to calculate this ferrocement, which is the most complex thing? is because he knows. And those who are not ready to do it, because they don't know. It's as simple as that for me. So if I'm, I've always wanted all of those things to get tested. There are very few people who are working on that. But I think we really need to, you know, in our times, we know less than in our parents and much less than our grandparents. So that is not development. So obviously in academia, at least, we should ensure that we continue to know. Like people used to draw better, <laughs> calculate better, everything better. Sorry, I don't, don't take it personal. But I know that pe why, why in the same number of years, people were considered to be adults when they were 21 years. They had profession. I started my office at 23. So why do we have this insecurity that I still don't know, I still don't know how to keep learning, I have to keep, and yes, we have to keep learning, but keep learning through life. You know, we must always, and keep, if you keep doing the learning in the university, doesn't mean you have to disconnect from the reality. You can still contribute. So I, I hope that, ideally, I would like all the research to be happen in the academic environment because that's the best conditions we have. And why should we not do actual projects? There's so many real problems in the world. Why do we need to do frivolous, you know, things that just because it has to look different? And there's so many, like Charles and Ray Eames said, you know, there's so many real problems to be solved. So I think... But also I think, you know, to further extend what you're saying, I think it's very interesting that you admit in your first project you didn't know what you were doing. And I think... Like the idea that we have to be experts and we have to have everything figured out before we begin something and to, you know, in many contexts, the risk is severe because it's somebody else's money, it's your liability, yeah. it's your reputation. But I, I think that there are many, many opportunities that we can take risks, you know. And at the very least, I think in circumstances when you're doing... Uh, installation work and, and that's why you know as students you know I think it's a great opportunity when you're in school but also when you're out of school is to take on those opportunities to make proposals for PS1 young I mean talk about bricks and experimentation with David Benjamin you know but I think that that's not the only that's not the only time and that we can continue to you know looking at Ada and Giuseppe you know how to continue experimenting in work yeah. uh, I, I don't want to I don't mean to sound critical of academia at all what I mean is like I, I mean I have moved into academia more formally because I believe in it more than anything else because I think it's important to take the time to think and in the real practice uh, not everybody does the takes the time and does the thinking because sometimes you don't have like I had already started that way so for me it's I've got already a certain, you know, environment around me in my practice. But I know that, so I just try to bring this um, quality to students and, and whether they're in the first year, third year, whatever, it doesn't matter when you're on the site, you realize everybody has to learn something at their own level. And, and together, everybody's at a different level. Each human being has a different thing and that's the richness. There's no need even to standardize that learning process. I think everybody, the, what is important is the curiosity and the clarity of the question and then you can answer it. And that's why I've been striving to come up to, I always wanted to work with Mike Schleich. Now look, the reason to do the Venice project that way was because I don't, because I really value resources, including money and time. I didn't want the money of the Biennale, which is a lot of money. I mean, they, first of all, they don't even give it to you. You have to fundraise it and whatever. And then with that money, I, I, where would I invest money? Always in knowledge. So I want to involve, and now I can afford to work through this context. I can work with them as collaborators. I would not have been able to pay that project, you know? And so all of this that we did, whatever we spent, um, if you count how many people learned things out of it, it was enormous. And 
it's not, was that hundred and something thousand that we spent in Venice worth it for an exhibition? In my opinion, I don't think so. But for all that we are doing on the site, absolutely. And that's why I wanted to exhibit the thing that I'm going to spend so much time doing and whatever. It should have many more layers of meaning. Well, it's going to have many more lives, so it's not just one exhibition, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll open it up to the audience if anybody has any questions. We can hear you. <laughs> You know, the, the, the kind of um, scale you talked about, that is the easy thing. If I have a big commission, if the funds are there, go to my slash, go to the big companies, do that's the easy part. I'm not researching ferrocement only for its own sake, you know. I, I'm trying to, for years, looking at how people could empower themselves to contribute towards their own housing in order to make it significantly cheaper and faster, significantly faster. If you can get a house assembled in a week, you'll, be, you'll not have to worry about inflation. You don't have to have the tiring thing. You know, so I mean, I've, the reason I'm working with it that way is because I want to actually, I'm, all of these technologies that I'm working with are keeping the people in mind. It's not like plugging the people in afterwards into the process. It's, it's, and that's why they are there in that, you know, I'm trying to see, that's why this prototype thing has been a big work for me because I'm trying to see how could people be able to make their own, what kind of ferro cement can you allow them to make that is safe? What size can they carry? They're literally designed so that four people could carry the piece and, you know, transport it instead of, uh, you know, it could go with a cow cart even or whatever. So those are, that's why these designs look the way they do. I never put the concerns of the client first. Don't tell them. Okay. So that was my question. No, the thing is that, uh, you know, the reason why I've done the kind of projects I've done is also because if the client and my values coincide, then I've done them. But if they have not, you know, then we've argued or we've discussed, you know. But if I don't agree, like I would, if I would not, if, if the client wants me to cut costs, on certain areas, like social equity and all that, I would not do the project. So I haven't done those projects. I have a lot of things you don't see are the ones I didn't get the job or I didn't agree or whatever, you know? <laughs> so, you know what I mean? Like, you know, there are things, it's not me just wanting to you know, romantically preserve the craftsman thing, you know? It's just that I came to the artisan aspect First, I, I began with my environmental concern because we just cannot go on the way we, we are going on. You know, so there are things that some people would ask me to do, I wouldn't do them. I would explain. I think basically everybody's reasonable and if you explain and find a way, um, so that if it doesn't look just religious, but you find a way to uh, talk reason, it usually goes further. Next comes the technologies you have to choose. And then, of course, who, which client will want to purposely spend extra money, 
So they will care about cost-efficient solutions. So there's no reason why they wouldn't go on with us normally. And so, but I'm not, I haven't been just interested in finding projects to run my office. If that's the case, I have not been doing those projects. I'm doing projects where I would be meaningfully engaged and where my intelligence can be involved and not just to feed my office, you know, in terms. So a lot of projects are sometimes that way. Absolutely. But for me, the biggest resource is my own life and my own time. Yeah. And that's the one I first want to conserve. I don't want to do things where, you know. Yeah, but not in the sense of like a capitalist sense, right? Not for your benefit, but for the client trying to extend their money as far as they can. Mm -hmm. Like if a decision needs to be made, do we protect the intangible heritage or do we use another source? You know, what is the moral structure? No, I don't think there's any moral structure. It will always, you just negotiate and it will always be a reasonable thing because I'm, I'm an open-minded person. The client will also be so. We'll discuss and we'll de decide which compromise would compromise. A, you never want to compromise a higher value for a lower one. So we architects are always doing this sort of negotiation and I think nothing is imposed religiously or into these processes. I have, in the Venice Biennale, I've focused on these issues, and those are the ones I'm, you know, mostly showing here. But I wouldn't take up, you know, out of context and impose, you know, artisans from somewhere and look for, you know, no, not necessary. But the, yeah, it's very contextual. Kate. Um, I th yeah, I think it's pretty con con like uh, very conventionally, I would say. Sorry for the banal answer. Yeah, I mean, I, so I, I yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a drawing. I mean, I um, came from a school where there was a very good tradition of very good technical drawing as well as artistic drawings, watercolors, all of that. So. You know, I believe a lot in drawing being the communication medium of the architect. However, the thing that I had to change is the dimensioning. Because when you work, people tend to dimension those dimension chains from both ends, and you'll never know where to adjust the error, this side or that. So definitely, I, 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 I really am impatient when people don't, they think that you can get away without drawing everything. I, I'm not that way. I really feel everything has to be thought out and drawn out perfectly. But the dimensioning, because when you work with non-standard materials, that has to be, again, it's the uh, knowledge of drawing and dimensioning. Yes, but that, that came to my rescue, in fact. The fact that if you learn to draw well, you know how to dimension that nobody will make an error on the site. You know. Uh, how the product has to be adjusted according to what, etc. So I think it's the drawings that save all this experimentation, you know, every little joint. And yes, definitely, because we are not aiming to, uh, we, are, we are aiming to have the least, uh, you know, errors accumulating and all of that. But it's true that most people feel like you can directly, the reason I do those one-to-one -one things are rather for testing and predicting those areas that you cannot tell. Like for example, in a vault, because those, there'll be different degrees to which you can insert one pot in the other, and you may or may not fit the, uh, the same number in each row. You may have to cut a pot or whatever. So I have to plan that into the way that my standard section will be interpreted with a note and, and so on. And, and uh, definitely, it's, uh, thanks to my very classical education, I was able to take care of all that, yeah. Any other questions? Nope. Oh, okay. Two more and then we'll call it a night. Hi, thank you very much for your lecture. It was great. Um, my question is more about, it's not a question, I was just wondering what your opinion is about 
for instance like i'm very recently actually exposed to all like very very new digital techniques and i'm absolutely fascinated by it and some of which i wasn't familiar with at all i studied in india for my undergraduate and um where um in pune and uh, i visited auroville and like saw all your structures but um i was wondering now it's almost taking a step back in a saying so i won't put you it's almost like the whole vernacular debate that you know you, you were wondering about but it's like these two almost very distinct things whether it's like building with natural material and local material or say 3d printing stuff and like choosing from a palette that's universal to you know build fast and manufacture things for housing and like you know easing solutions everywhere but then this technology about using local materials to build faster and like using building technology by like truth to the material to i mean which is really important to understand the material so i wanted to know because if you understand from this palette of things that you can 3d print from and now i think the palette's growing day by day so i was wondering what your opinion was of that technology uh you you asking me whether i like digital technology or hate them no not if I you know. like or hate them but whether there will be a, because now that palette's increasing as well like you know things that I you think, can uh, i buy. think i believe and th- again thanks to uh my indian background probably i believe in coexistence i i i think the people uh, very easily think that if something happens the other thing has to be completely outdated and this is something i've also experienced in the developed countries more but in india the the cow cart continues to go behind beside all the fancy cars you know it it the things don't people wear modern clothes they don't give up the sarees and they don't give up their jewelry and so i i don't believe in just because there's a new technology that comes out i never feel that therefore let's just throw the baby with the bath water you know it's not something I've, i automatically think so i i'm also as excited about all those possibilities i've worked with iac as well i just because i'm not obsessed or for me it's not i'm not obsessed with all that either i would like to i would like to use what is relevant i wouldn't think that now i have to only think in those terms you know even if i don't have a computer i would be fine i mean i'm using it because socially this is how we are in this but you know it's not like we had gone to um there was a panel discussion where I was surprised where wolf pricks had mentioned you know we were we were together on on a panel in sydney and he talked about you know without computers a lot of the things they do would not be possible and i can't think that way you know i understand where he's coming from but for me whatever i want to do would be possible because it's we who made the computer if i need it for something i can but i cannot be not able to function anymore if there's a power cut i am not ready to accept that because i know that look i know how to calculate maybe that systems certain things become very automated and yes those are the places where this robotic thing should be diverted i don't want to see a situation where the machines are intelligent and we are robotic this is what not what i'm you know looking at I just feel like I'll be the intelligent one I'll use the robot when I want not the other way around you know but and I think there's definitely research is good and it's good to develop all of that but I think too easily we are giving up other things without knowing whether we can manage without them that's that's the thing I think there's even without rationalizing it i just like to knit so i i don't need to justify if i want to knit i'll buy ready mades whenever i want and if i want to knit i'll knit you know but the fact that i know how to knit is allowing me to do a fabric installation now in the next uh, couple of months because there's a lot of mathematics involved a lot of knowledge involved you never know where what you know comes can be useful elsewhere so i just don't like the idea of being passive in the face of all those technologies if you are awake and conscious of course it's great all the advances one more question thank you for your lecture um i was very interested in um you mentioned the intelligence of the hand um and having read uh richard said the past man has you know just growing up using my hands um very interested in that and kind of thinking about the obvious question about 
you know, I, I believe that there needs to be a, a convergence or a coexistence, um, and specifically to um, academia and student work in a studio. Um, you know, I, 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 I love model making, and it's, uh, I, I definitely see it, I guess, decline, I think, in the, in the quality. Um, and I was curious how you see, you know, how you see that integration happening of, of like, for example, the digital fabrication team that still do the first prototypes by hand of the book, but then figure out, you know, in a, an academic setting, how do students work uh, to integrate? See, what I really um, feel sad about often is when some of my students are not able to express themselves because they're still learning AutoCAD and whatever, and they're not, they, they, are, they don't believe in the capacity to convey the idea simply with it, by drawing it, and then keep doing the AutoCAD and check out whatever they want. So I feel like what I, I don't mind, I tell them, look, you can use whatever. For me, like, I don't, I'll never insist on this or that. If the quality of the drawing that is, you know, that is shown to me, and if, you know, if, if they cannot convey themselves through whichever medium, they are not good enough at it. They are limited sometimes in digital development. They are sometimes limited by the designer of that software and whatever else. And they don't trust themselves to just say, okay, if this is not working out, I'm just going to do it myself. I'm just, they think that they, they it's, it's all become so standardized that even if you ask somebody for, my son was four years old and he said, mommy, can you give me an A4? He wasn't even asking for a paper. So that's how it has become now. You know, somebody invented uh, the, the common format printer. So there are many advantages of the fact that everything is A4. You know, but, but to, you know, it's get so deeply ingrained, I think the important thing is to just realize that all of these are there for improving our lives and uh, getting what we want, and not that we are enslaved by them. That's, if that awareness is there, you would use whatever will get you further, and at the high, highest quality. Okay, I think we'll let you have a drink and some dinner. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, everyone, Thank for joining us. Thank you all us. for this discussion. Thank you. That was great. It was so interesting.